Well, hello. And finally, technology has caught up with us in the midweek service. Not sure whether we should be impressed by that or whether we should be terrified by it. Personally, I'm terrified. But as you'll see, the understudy midweek service leadership thought that it would be a good idea to try and keep in touch with you all. That happens individually, of course, and hopefully that's working well. But we wanted to keep in touch as a group as well. We're aiming to share news and to keep you in the loop. So if you've got news to share or requests for prayer or anything like that, if you can let Michael Pryor know, he'll get a kind of news sheet out to us roughly once a fortnight. But the other thing is that since every other congregation at CBC is still getting teaching, we thought that it might be helpful to continue to share God's word with you all every other Wednesday, beginning this week, April the 8th, and then the 22nd and so on. So far, I've got two messages on the way. After Easter, I want to dig down into the hope that Easter brings, which actually we, we need very much right now. But initially, I'm going to finish our Easter series of messages and explore the sheer wonder of what Jesus did for each and every one of us. The Bible reading today is one of my absolute favourites. It's an astonishing bit of scripture, and it's Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. And yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, although he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Well, so far in our Easter series, we followed the Palm Sunday crowds acclaiming Jesus as King. We joined Jesus and his disciples in the upper room for their Passover meal. And that meal, if you remember, begins like every other Passover does by celebrating God's rescue of the Israelites from Egypt some thousand or more years before. But then in the middle of the meal, Jesus does something different. He announces himself as God's new rescuer, God's new redeemer. He is the one who is going to bring freedom from sin and death through his own death and resurrection. From that moment, things begin to move rather quickly in the Easter story. That night in the Garden of Gethsemane, <clears throat> Jesus is arrested. 
the religious authorities convene a hasty kangaroo court to find him guilty of blasphemy. But that's not enough. The Jews have no judicial right of execution, so they need the Roman authorities to pass a sentence of crucifixion. Well, the Romans aren't interested in blasphemy or, for that matter, in any other aspect of Jewish law. So when they haul Jesus before Pontius Pilate, it is on charges of attempting to raise rebellion against Rome. Pilate, for his part, hates these guys. And anyway, this is a paper thin ploy that he sees through immediately. But they press their case. Jesus, they say, has proclaimed himself king of the Jews, and in the end, Pontius Pilate bad-temperedly gives in to their demands. After all, it won't do for reports to reach Rome that he had the so-called king of the Jews in his custody, and then he let them, him go free. So now there's an hour or two in the early morning when the soldiers are holding Jesus for, in preparation for crucifixion. They amuse themselves by blindfolding him, shoving a makeshift crown of thorns down on his head, grabbing some tatty old garment in imperial purple and putting it on him. And then they slap her around the face, they hit him with sticks and they shout, prophesy, prophesy, who just hit you? And then it's time for crucifixion. But actually time is scarce because it all has to be done before the Passover Sabbath the following day. So they parade Jesus up the streets leading out of Jerusalem, king of the Jews, not just wearing a crown this time, but weighed down with the heavy cross beam to which he is about to be nailed. He's so badly knocked about that he collapses under the weight of it, and the bystander Simon of Cyrene is forced to carry it. On Skull Hill, Golgotha, the hammer and the nails do their work, wrists and ankles. The cross is jolted down into the socket that's been dug for it and the final torture begins. It is now nine o'clock in the morning because Jesus has to be dead and removed from the cross together with the other prisoners by nightfall. Now, I talked last time about Jesus being our redeemer, our rescuer, from ourselves, from our sin, from death itself. But the question is how? What, it is it, what is it that Jesus did that makes it possible for us to be set free? And to answer that question, I want to look at the account of the first Easter, not as it was written at the time or afterwards, but written 500 years and more before it happened. I want to look at Isaiah 53. Now, there have been attempts to offer interpretations of Isaiah 53 that don't involve Jesus Christ, but they don't actually work. There's a suggestion that the servant who suffers is the Jewish people, but that can't be right, because verse 8 tells us that he was cut off from the land of the living, quote, for the transgression of my people. In other words, he suffered and he died for the Jews, amongst others, of course. If he died for the Jews, he cannot be the Jews, obviously. Others have wondered if Isaiah is talking about himself as the servant of God who suffered for others. But the narrative of death and resurrection cannot possibly fit Isaiah or any other prophet for that matter. Instead, what you've got are striking parallels with the gospel accounts of the first Easter. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by mankind. And right through the gospel narratives of the passion, there is this note of contempt. Jesus is insulted, spat at, mocked, made the butt of everybody's jokes. Verse 9, he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Jesus is crucified as if he is the leader of an armed rebellion, but he actually never lifted a finger against another human being. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. There's Jesus before Pilate, facing all kinds of ridiculous accusations, and there's Pilate saying, oh, come on, man, can't you hear what they're saying about you? Haven't you got anything to say? 
he doesn't even dignify them with a response. Instead, he stays silent in the face of provocation and baiting. Verse 2 tells us that uh, there was nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. In fact, the back end of chapter 52 goes further. His appearance was so disfigured and his form marred beyond human likeness. Blood pouring down his face from the thorns, pouring down his legs from his beaten back, blood dripping down from wrists and ankles, his body grotesquely contorted on the cross. Our Jesus must have looked indeed scarcely human. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. False accusations, kangaroo court, condemned on a transparent legal fiction. Verse 9 again, he was assigned a grave with the wicked. He's condemned alongside the guilty, the saviour of the world, placed between two murderers and with the rich in his death. Not in this case the evil rich, but he's laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy sympathiser. And then verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. You see, astonishingly, his, his death is not the end, but it's a beginning. There is a resurrection to follow. There's a prolonging of days. Verse 11, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. There is a flourishing of God's purpose in him who had seemed utterly defeated. There is a life-giving power that is now given to others as a result of his death for him, them. My righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. People will be put into a right relationship with God because of this seemingly irredeemable tragedy. And then finally, he will be exalted to the highest place in heaven. Verse 12 tells us, therefore, I give him a portion with the great. You see, you read this and it's extraordinary that the story of Jesus' death and resurrection is told. And it is told with such unmistakable detail, 500 years and more before it occurs. Yet in a sense, of course, it's not totally surprising because the cross is on the one hand an outrage of man of course but it is also the purpose of God but still my original question remains how how does the cross of Jesus Christ help us how does this death followed by this resurrection end up changing our entire world how does it enable you and me to be set free and to be brought into the family of God and the answer is given above all in three key verses, right in the middle of this extraordinary chapter. Those verses are verses four to six. And I'll, oh, let's grab a Bible here. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering and yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Those verses highlight two things. The first is the way that we are. Isaiah is painting a picture of our lives and frankly, it's not a pretty one. We are, first of all, transgressors. We break God's commands, we flout his values, we turn our back on him. We are guilty of iniquity. We've lost our way. We're willful in choosing what we want over what God commands. And when you throw God's map into the bin, it's no wonder that you end up lost. And that's exactly what's happened to us. We've gone astray like sheep, wandering off with no proper sense of direction. In the words of the Beatles song, we are real nowhere men and nowhere women. We've lost our way. 
Worse than that, we're sick. We need healing as our lives are infected with the virus of sin and as we infect others with it as well. There's a range of infirmities that we end up with as we drift away from God's purpose for us. It isn't a great place to be. We're at war and we are victims of all kinds of sorrows. We may long for peace, but we don't have the power in ourselves to achieve it because we've rejected the giver of peace. No wonder so much heartache ensues. And finally, we deserve punishment. Our sin, our wrong choices bring their own dire, horrible consequences. But beyond that, we deserve the judgment of God. Well, that's a picture of us. Left to ourselves, that's the way we are. But hallelujah, God didn't leave us to ourselves. Because the second thing that you see in these verses is what Jesus has done. And essentially it's this. Everything negative that rightfully belonged to us, the Lord Jesus took from us and carried on his own shoulders on the cross. He took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Our punishment was on him. His peace is given to us in exchange. Our wounds were borne on his cross. And says Isaiah, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, this is what Jesus did when he died on the cross for us. He effected the great exchange. He sucked the poison out of our sick lives and he took it instead into his own self. He carried the punishment that should have been ours. He died for each of us spiritually. And he, in doing that, did what he did physically for Barabbas. Barabbas? Well, you might remember Barabbas in the Bible story. He's a guilty criminal. He's facing death. He's sentenced to die for his crimes. But because Jesus takes his place, Barabbas ends up going free. The prison doors open. He's able to walk out a free man, back to his family, back to the life that he thought he had lost. An innocent man dies, but because of that, a guilty man is able to go free. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and me. Not just to change things for us in this life, but to change things for eternity. Imagine it like this. Here is my sin weighing me down in this hand. I can't carry it. It's so heavy. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And now I'm free of it. He dies, I live. He's punished, I'm forgiven. He is separated from the Father's love on the cross, but I'm brought home. It's an amazing and life-changing exchange. A great reversal. So I, in the words of the Bible, am justified. Because of Jesus, it is just as if I'd never sinned. Amazing. All of which leaves us with two big questions. First of all, have I personally trusted in Jesus Christ and in what he's done for me? Have you? Trusting in Jesus is a simple but far-reaching step that any one of us can take at any time. In fact, it is as simple as A, B, C. A, accept God's free gift of forgiveness in Jesus. It may be tough for our pride to take, but God's forgiveness and acceptance are a free gift or they're nothing at all because we sure as heck are never going to earn them. B, believe in Jesus. And when I say that, I don't just mean that we believe some true facts about Jesus in our heads. I mean, as the Bible means, in trusting our lives to Jesus Christ, trusting him for our past, our present and our future, letting him forgive our past, guide our present and shape our future. And C, commit ourselves to learn from Jesus and put our lives under his management. As I say, it's as simple as ABC, but it is an incredibly far-reaching step. Accept, believe, commit, and receive life as a result. It's sobering 
to know that it is possible to be around in Christian circles for a long, long time without ever having personally taken that step. And if that's you, there's no shame in it. But now, let me say, is the time to do something about it. And any of us in the midweek service leadership would be more than happy in a socially distant, um, self-isolating way to, to help you to take that step. The second big question, perhaps for most of us, is if I have personally trusted Jesus Christ, how far does my life, or yours for that matter, reflect the enormity of what Christ has done for us? You see, given what Jesus has done for us, there is something grotesque about being a lukewarm Christian. Somebody who believes but lives as if actually it isn't such any big deal. And, you know, why would this matter so much? I've got to tell you, this is an incredibly big deal. And actually, the only response that comes close to being adequate is the one we sometimes sing in our Easter hymn, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I'd like to pray a blessing on us. Father God, with all the bad news and tough circumstances that we're dealing with right now, we want to thank you for the good news that Easter reminds us of, of the love that in Jesus reached down into our world and reaches down to us still here today. For the astonishing grace in which Jesus took our place on the cross and died for us. Thank you, Lord, for the power that raised Jesus from the dead and carries for us to the promise that nothing, not sin in us, not evil in the world, not even death itself, can stand against us who belong to the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And in these strange and trying times, would you grace our homes with your company? Would you touch our hearts with your love? Would you steady our minds with your patience? Would you help us to cast every anxiety, every fear upon you? And by your spirit, come into each heart and home. Keep us safe in body, trusting you in our spirit. And at the right time, Lord, bring us joyfully back together again. In Jesus' name. And may your blessing rest and remain with each one of us now and always. Amen.